Um, so I'm here as a hardcore effective field theorist, and I've tried. I want to talk about non-locality, um, just as a as a topic. Now, in, normally when we're doing quantum field theory calculations, we don't really bother much about non-locality. It's, some things are non-local, but the, what the heck, we just calculate away and you cal make, calculate the amplitude, go measure it. Um, it. It's a little bigger of a deal in general relativity because we do general relativity in space-time and we have a manifold and we've got geodesics and we've got um, the a local differential equation and crisp events, things happen. Um, and so, but quantum physics disrupts some of that. And I mean, partially because loops with massless particles aren't, aren't con constrained locally. They propagate long distances. And we have some tools to explain some of that. Now, there's still a lot to be done, but I'm going to tell you about some of the things that have been done. Um, so the basic outline is, first I'll just talk about I'm not going to do everything about the effective field theory, but just want to talk about this local versus non-local. Um, some results, which I grandiosely call low energy theorems, um, but including some uh, universal soft theorem at one loop, which um, is interesting, and some equivalence principle violations. Um, and then we'll try to, th this is all perturbative stuff in, in Minkowski, and try to move on from that to doing non-local stuff that's not in Minkowski by doing a nonlinear completion. And then if there's time at the end, I'll try talking about some of the challenges that this whole program gives to the two effective field theory by itself. From the effective field theory side, um, so what, what effective field theorist thinks about it. Okay, so this, this locality versus non-locality is actually at the heart of what effective field theory is. Now, physics is an experimental science, and there's certainly going to be lots of modifications before we get to the Planck scale, but experiment isn't going to probe that any day soon. So, but what we do know something, and the, the main thing that we know that's useful here, it's basically the uncertainty principle. which tells us that high energy effects are local when viewed at low energy. So some, some, some effects of heavy particles at high energies come out looking local when viewed at low energies. So our action is constructed out of a bunch of things, some Lagrangians that are local to start with, and these are ordered in energy so that we don't have to deal with all of them at once. And so we've reduced our ignorance of the physics that we don't know to some constants, or counting the constants. But low energy is not local. So, you know, you do photon exchange, that's 1 over q squared, goes like 1 over r. That's something of relatively long distance. But even in loops, so let's imagine I'm doing some loop, some loop process there. This has a high energy piece, which that part's going to be local, so some of, some of that is local, and some of it's not, the low energy. You know, for example, if you're doing this thing, there's a cut there. Everything goes on shell. They propagate as far as they want to propagate. And in that neighborhood, they're very non-local. And this non-locality happens for massless particles, especially. And for couplings, the, the couplings that are relevant then are the couplings near zero energy. And 
Okay, so those are things that we're supposed to know. So the effective field theory proceeds by by this pathway. So the effective field theory in gravity we would have the action being curvature plus curvature squared. And we now we we do a full effect full field theory treatment of this. So you quantize, you you renormalize. You'd renormalize these guys. Um, and there's within the, the theory there's a, a power counting theorem. That one one loop renormalizes the curvature squared terms, which are four derivatives. Two loops curvature cubed, six derivatives, etc. Okay, um, but in some sense, even though it's technically been interesting that it's possible, that's in a way of the boring part of the theory. That comes from the highest energy. We don't really know or what's going on there. But leftover stuff, is, is predictions. So we have this derivative expansion or energy expansion for the local stuff. The leftover stuff tends to be non-analytic in, in coordinate space. So we'll see square root of q squareds and we'll, we'll see log of q squareds, the typical ones that you find in field theory. And these turn into power law non-localities. So we're not talking here about Planck scale non-localities. That's, of course, possible there, too. This is power law non-localities. Um, so let's let's sort of stop the general presentation there. But this phrase, low energy theorem, is something that's used in the effective energy with a specific meaning. What it means is it's it's things that depend depend only on the light degrees of free the freedom. So can I just ask a question? Sure, uh, of course. So when you when you use this word non-locality, yeah. can I can I accurately describe that more precisely by saying that if I were to compute the one PI effective action, it would have non-local terms in it? Is that, or, is that the thing you I, I think that's what you're saying. Right? Um, and of course yeah. the quantum field theory is a local theory in the sense that it, stuff it, it, the, the, the starts off local here and the and the loops give you the non-local stuff. And so yes, there will be there will be there will be the Wilson action will local. always be local. That's yes, the Wilson action. Yes, this is this. One pi action is the thing that yes. is going to be non-local. Yes. Yes. Here. yes, the effective action will be non-local. Yeah, actually, I'll write out one later on. That's an uh, effective action that you'll see. Uh, I'm going to start off with just matrix elements. You'll see it in matrix elements first, and then in a real effective action later on. Okay. Um, so this, the low energy theorems are things that depend only on the low energy degrees of freedom in, in interactions uh, that are in, then insensitive to any, any UV completion. So they hold for any UV completion. So. Okay, so that's that's what we'll do first. We'll do first a, few, uh, a bunch of those, um, and then we'll try building up to things that are more interesting. Actually, I forgot to say my collaborators. That's that's an embarrassment. 
Barry Holtzi, Emile Beer and Bohr, Pierre Van Hove, her faculty collaborators, Mohamed Anber, Andy Ross, Tibor Turma, Ludovic Plante, and Basim El Manoufi will be here next week. So you get to meet him. Okay, so let's let's first just do a dictionary. I'm gonna first just do my favorite example, which is this the gravitational potential at low energies. And we have the potential is G M M over, over R R with corrections one plus a G M over R, which is a classical effect. And then the unique linear and h bar linear in G effect goes like one over R squared compared to the leading piece. And then we will also see uh, a delta function contribution, which is not local. That's, that's certainly something that's not local. We do, we do these calculations in momentum space, and the, the transition from that is the matrix elements have terms that go like 1 over q squared, obviously, from the first piece. The terms that correspond to that go look like um, g um, square root of m squared over q squared, minus q squared, actually. Okay, so it's a square root non-locality, which you find in the calculations, or non-analyticity. And these guys go like g log minus q squared. And then you can get analytic stuff, which goes like q squared. And clearly, the, the analytic stuff, the stuff that has no non-analyticities, oh, I'm sorry. It's just this, I haven't factored out. It's just a one, uh, a constant. The constants, when you Fourier transcode, go to delta functions, and these others go into their other ones. So if you want the classical effects, you want the square root, et cetera. OK? So let's draw some Feynman diagrams. We get, we draw that. We draw a diagram that looks like that. We draw a diagram that looks like these are gravitons, of course. That, let's put the ghosts in. Maybe there's diagrams that look like this. I'm oh, sorry. Look like this. What else? I want boxes also. You have to do boxes. OK. Um, and so if you know what those the vertex functions look like, especially that triple graviton vertex, you know, this is like um, Henrietta said, uh, index heaven. But you. <laughs> or hell. Or hell. <laughs> so, John, these are like the, the, the loop terms or like the q squared log q squared in pi on physics? Is yeah, that? exactly. Yeah, actually, in pine physics, you also get this when you have baryons around. Okay. Um, okay. So, but you, you so you look at that for a few minutes, and then you write down the answer, which is v of r is minus g m m over r one plus three g m plus m over r plus 41 over 10 pi g h bar over r squared. OK, so there's the, the, the quantum correction that you get out of that. Um, a couple things to say about this. Um, this is the, the right post-Newtonian correction. That was that was actually done actually a long time ago by 
Iwasaki and, and Gupta and Radford from Feynman diagrams, just the way we uh, just you know, draw these pictures and calculate away. Um, it comes from a bunch of diagrams. I'll, I'll say more about it in a minute, but, but those two are the most important ones. Um, Which two? Okay, it's the, the Y diagram. Yeah, the Y in this one. Yeah, we'll, we'll actually go through why, uh, why that appears. Um, and just in connection to some of our previous discussion uh, last week, if you look at this one by itself, it gives you Duff's correction to the uh, short shield. So that, that one by itself gives you the correction to shield. That would the first term of the short shield expansion. Um, now, there's, if you look at this, you, <coughs> you, you note that one of the things that we're doing is we're getting classical physics from loops. And many textbooks have what is really a folk theorem, but is uh, sometimes said to be a theorem, that the loop expansion is the h-bar expansion. Um, and the, it's not true. Uh, the, the place it fails when you're actually doing the proof, you try pulling out all these h-bars in front of the action to get, to get the overall factor of h-bar out. But what you forget when you leave behind is you leave behind masses that look like m over h bar um, is what's left behind in the action. And so these, these square roots of m squared over q squared really have 1 over h bars in them. And so there's an overall factor of h bar that, that you have pulled out from that goes into the loop expansion. Um, but you get this extra factor here, which is why, why this guy is the piece that gives you classical physics. Now, you can actually trace this into Feynman diagram language. In, in Feynman diagram language, if you have a, a, a triangle diagram with one massive leg and two massless legs. So the scalar triangle with one massive leg has a square root. That's where, that's where you find it. Um, so these guys come from here and here. It could come from here during Passerino Veltman. This, this could have a triangle as it's part of its Passerino Veltman reduction. But it, in this case, in a harmonic gauge, it doesn't seem to. So that's, that's just what happens. Um, OK, so there we now know how to pick out classical physics and where to find it. Okay, the, um, the h-bar term here actually turns out to be a, a um, low energy theorem or a, a soft theorem, a universal theorem. Okay, and this was found originally by Holstein and Ross, who, being masochists, just decided to calculate away and do spin zero and spin zero, spin zero and a half, spin, spin a half on a half, spin one on spin zero, just, just plugging away. Um, it's painful, but once you get used to some, the, the tricks, it's not so terrible. Um, but they're doing Feynman diagrams. And if you're doing Feynman diagrams, these diagrams look remarkably Different. You get even different diagrams for different spins. You know, so this, well, and all the couplings are different and the loops are different, yet, yet they ended up finding that that factor was the same. And in fact, there's also a spin orbit piece which they found was the same. Um, actually, here's where these amplitude, these new amplitude methods actually can be very useful and come in. And so um, with Emil Pierre and Bohr, Pierre van Hove, we, we did this, redid the calculation in a way that um, shows how this can be a universal factor. Um, basically, we did it in these, these new amplitude methods. Um, and 
so basically, what, do, what does that mean? That means you, that you take, let's, let's allow that to be gravitons. Here's all these gravitons. You, you calculate, <coughs> excuse me, what is basically um, gravitational Compton scattering. Com, graviton in on a tar, uh, target, graviton in on a target. Um, so it's just the gravitational amplitude. Um, and you then multiply them together, project out the boxes, bubbles, and triangles. And so from the unitarity cut, you get the, you get the reconstructed in terms of boxes, bubbles, and triangles. And then you write out the, the answer. And it's actually much simpler than doing that other one once you get you can do that Pasarino Veltman reduction. Um, it's even better because this guy, as we saw last week from the Burns talk, is really the square of the of the the so these are these are gravitons here. It's the square of another amplitude, which is gravitate uh, electromagnetic Compton amplitude. This is it's the QED one actually. And you know, I normally think of it as Yang Mills. Maybe it's Yang Mills too. I don't know, but QD maybe probably because it's uh, the outside matter is just a scalar. Um, but anyhow, any 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 student can calculate this thing real easily. You square that, you plug it in here, and you've got your answer. Um, much easier. Um, the I've also done it in the following way. I've also written a dispersion relation where you you get the amplitude out of doing the integral over the imaginary part. Um, and the imaginary part is also determined by the cuts. And I mean, the difference here is you, you have a phase space integral to do in the middle. You, don't have, you can't just multiply them together. You have to do some phase space integral. Um, but it's also determined just by the low energy structure. Um, this, this, this also works. So, I, and basically, we've got three methods here, um, and some of the features that come out of this is one is we get a test of gauge invariance, and it's not a surprise because the Feynman diagram calculation is done in harmonic gauge with ghosts. The these guys have these amplitudes here are done in a sort of axial gauge. They have no ghosts at all. So you don't need any ghosts. And I did this one here, both in harmonic gauge and in these, the axial gauges, the, the, the helicity amplitudes gauges. Um, and so we reproduce it. And so it's actually, it was quite satisfying after all, the algebra that goes into that one to just multi, put it on a computer and just multiply it together. It's, it's really quite simple. Um, but the other thing is that that the by doing this you get this this soft theorem, which for the the Compton amplitudes was done by Weinberg, and that was also discussed last week here, uh, where we we saw. Well, I mean, it was, I, I often call it the, the low, low energy theorems, but, but, all right. Low energy Compton scatter. Yeah. Yeah, all right, so maybe. The, Weinberg's Brandeis lectures are the, are the a good source for this discussion. Uh, sorry. So Goldberger, low, Weinberg, I don't know. Gelman. Um, but anyhow, and so here, the leading amplitudes are are universal. When we then multiply these together, we you see actually from this expansion here that the first correction here, the lead, very leading thing. It goes like one over the square root of t. The the next leading 
is is just a, is up by one power of the square root of t. The corrections to the soft theorems are at order t. So by the fact that these differ by just the factor of square root of t, I mean that we that both the leading classical and the leading quantum piece are then universal following from the universality of the the on-shell amplitudes. I'm sorry, what does it mean that it's universal? It's independent it's, of the... It's independent of spin. It's independent of the particle content. The, the spin of the external particles? No, the, uh, yeah, the external particles. Yeah, I, this, is, this was done here. This calculation here was done for a scalar particle. There is a low energy theorem for Compton scattering, which is universal. It's proven by Gelman and Goldberg. Okay, sorry. And the uh, gravitational one was proven by Jakeefer myself. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, David, what did Wine move to? <laughs> <laughs> no, low energy theorems for emission of small particles from the scattering amplitude. This is not from the scattering amplitude. Compton scattering, as you know. Yeah. All right. Sorry. All right. <laughs> Fifty years ago. Okay. Good. Well, thank you. Well, that's that's, that's my excuse. <laughs> that's my excuse. I, I don't have much hair, but even 50 years ago, I didn't do too much physics. Anyway, so that's so that's that's the result we can get out of this. Um, and the, just as a pure curiosity, we have this um, this connection between two gravitons and two photons. That this one is the square of that one with some kin kinematic factors there. That doesn't persist at one loop. So if you're doing E and M, the the V ends up over here with a it's. 7 over 24 pi squared e squared h bar over m m r squared. Sorry. Something, yes, that's, that's a, all right. Uh, that's not, not been checked to publication quality. I just was, I just did it along the way to, to doing this other one just as a warm up. But it, it has been calculated in the literature by Feinberg and Sutcher. Okay. Okay. Um, let's do another, it's another scattering problem. This is light scatter, light bending. Um, it's again, the, I'd say the, the only way to, so here we've got photons coming in, photons going out, and these are gravitons, and then you take the vertex that you have down here with some scalar gravitational Compton, so these are gammas, or it was also done for massive scalars. Before going on, so one quick question on this. So um, is there any reason, well, you're getting out the, the leading order correction of Schwarzschild, and, and one might expect, as we were discussing last week, yeah. and <coughs> at least has argued that, um, at high orders you do too. Do right. you have any reason to expect that doesn't happen? No, I have every reason to expect it to happen. That's right. Okay. Um, I, I, w I, would, I would think. but. And I would love to have a way to, to actually do the sum. Yeah. But you know, the next order one has one with an extra graviton <laughs> coming out there. It's got the four graviton vertex. Yeah, I'm a little bit easy. scared of that one. Did yeah. Michael Duff have a paper where he does well, that? No, yeah, he, he, he argued for it, but I guess he... He only did the, the same thing that I did right here. He got that first term, uh -huh. and he said, this, this is going to work to all orders. Oh, I see. And he drew some pictures. <laughs> it was a more general argument. Um, you know, it's a... It, he, 
He said, this is obviously going to work for the Lord. But, but it did, you know, he didn't do it. It's, it's painful. I mean, <coughs> there are some people that, that, that do high order classical effective field theory for gravity, Goldberg and Rothstein and Andy Ross. And, um, but they also have not done Schwarzschild directly. They've Although, <coughs> Donald, Donald, you know, if you choose that gauge. Yeah, That's right. So, yeah, so, so Don, 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 Donald's gauge is a Kershild gauge. Sounds, sounds extremely promising in this regard. I think it's a little bit harder to fluctuations about that gauge. That's right. But... But that's simpler than summing up a whole series of diagrams that, that look like this to all loops. Come on. <laughs> so there's some hope in this life. All right. Anyway, so let's just uh, let me speed up a little bit on some of these things. Um, the photon scattering um, is even more indices. But if you're doing it this this uh, helicities amplitude way, it's not so bad. So if I'm scattering two, there's there's a bunch of things. There's, ca there's some normalization, kappa squared, which is G Newton, um, m squared, omega squared is the leading piece. There's a one over t. There's 15. Over. You don't care about the numbers, but I just want to point to something. Kappa squared, um, square root of m squared over minus t. There's, well, I'm not gonna, let me not write out of them all. I, there's one here that I do want to write, which is h bar kappa squared, I'll call it b gamma, log of minus t over 64 pi squared. There's a log squared with a coefficient, and, and there's a phase, the, cool, the Newton phase. So the thing that I just wanted to point out is, well, again, we get a classical effect coming out. It's, it's of course, not just the, the same one as the post-Newtonian non-relativistic approximation. This, and that's not 515, it's 512. Um, that should be identified as from the leading correction to Schwarzschild? Or? No, it's not leading. It's, it's, it's leading correction to light bending. I'll, I'll show you something about it a little bit. That turns out to be the number there. Um, there's, there's, these guys are expected. What's, what's a little different here than the previous case is that this B gamma is minus 161 over 120. But if I do a scalar, it's actually a minimally coupled scalar, is 3 over 40. OK, so one of the things that you, you start seeing here is that this is not universal. So when you say you do a scalar, you mean instead of the photon? Instead of the photon, yes, exactly. So basically, this line up there, a massless scalar. Um, uh, so you, you get something that's non-universal. Non um, at this stage, I have to be a little bit embarrassed. Is that we're, of course, would like to turn this into really light bending and get, get you a bending angle. The, I don't know of any per... One of the things, I, the other thing I should probably say is there's, there's a IR sensitivity um, in, inside the logarithms. These are IR infrared sensitive. Um, so you would like to have some way that you can do a light bending in, in, in some purely quantum mechanical way. Uh, and I've not seen it, at least in enough detail, that I could do something with this, the infrared singularities. Is that okay. coming from soft photons? Soft photons. Soft, soft yes. photons. Uh, well, soft, soft photons and soft gravitons. And soft gravitons. Yes. Both of them. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it's got all these complications. Um, you mean just, just, Actually, no, it's, it's just soft gravitons. Yeah, you don't have photons. It's just, just, I'm sorry. Yeah, they're not uh, photons. They're, but they're, some of the internal lines <coughs> are photons. Yeah, 
you think about this um, quantum correction term, you yeah. cannot do it. I mean, uh, yeah, so, well, so the classical correction. The, the classical okay. one I can, yes, yes, yes. yes. So in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what I could do classically. Okay, so I'm, I apologize before I did it. So let me let me now stop the apology and do it. Basically, you project this onto some potential V of R, and I'm going to then use that, which um, is 2G M omega over R, 15 over 4, G squared M squared omega. So again, linear and omega over R squared plus this 8 bi gm omega over r. There's a lot of other stuff there over r g h bar over r squared. So um, OK. And then you put it in a bending angle, and you, get, you actually get it's, it's quite beautifully that you get the first two corrections. You get the, the correct leading order piece. You get the, the second order piece. That's the 15. So there's the classical stuff to, to second order. Um, and then you get something that goes like 8 bi stuff pi. G squared M H bar is there and B cubed is there. Okay, you're not so much interested in the details, I don't think. But the 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 consequences of this are more interesting than the details. This, this is a very small correction. It's not likely to be. It's never going to be seen. Um, but it does, it does do two things. One is this is a violation of, of some formulations of the equivalence principle. Different particles move along different trajectories. They don't move along null geodesics anymore. The, the, and different particles behave differently. So those are two qualitative differences that are from usual general relativity. And they come mainly from tidal effects. If you think about it, it's just. You know, there are diagrams that look like this, where the particle may, may be sampling the metric at some point up here, but the, the loop sample the metric at a different point. And so you're, you're, the fact that you're not local um, leads to non-geodesic motion. Uh, it depends not only on the, the metric, but also on the gradients. And that's what, you, that's what you sort of see here. You see some, some, some Behavior that's not purely classical and a difference of different particles. So, so this equivalence principle of violation yeah. disappears at high frequencies, is the point? Um, no, actually, it gets. Uh, no, it doesn't get. No. So, um, so why are things more local at high frequencies? Why do you still see the tidal forces? Well, the, these, so these guys can be quite soft in the loops. The. the the high energy guy here can go through, but these guys can still be quite soft. The tidal forces on something, even at high energy, can turn it into pieces. Right? But can this be written as a, um, you know, just a correction to the geodesic equation that depends on the spin of this particle? Um, well, there are terms that depend on the spin and some that don't. Um, I'm sure that you could write it. You could you could formulate a a geodesic, well, a correction to it. Um, I'm actually more interested in doing, trying to figure out how to do a real quantum treatment of it, because I'm. I think the interesting thing here is really not so much the um, trying to correct, redo the geodesics, but trying to do these infrared singularities here. I think you get the infrared stuff is, is much more I, interesting. I, I'm a bit confused because the log mu. Uh, contributes a, a, a point, I mean, a, a delta function, right? Um, this is actually a, um, a stand-in for an infrared singularity. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't... And, and so we have to then just figure out some way to remove that infrared singularity. But I mean, the log mu, I mean, it sounds a little bit like the infinite Coulomb phase. It's, no, but the, the, yeah. cool, the Coulomb phase is right here. That, that we actually have that. 
But I mean, it's an ali as, as you were saying, it's not in the class of those delta function terms. The log yeah. thing. Um, well, in the log squared it is. Ah, the log, the, the log okay. squared is the only piece that survives. Yeah. Actually, I, if I'd written this out here a little bit more, you'd see the, the infrared piece. Okay. Log uh, squared. Yeah. The, the, this one doesn't have the, the, the um, despite okay. despite having the meter. Doesn't depend but on the, you. But, but the but log, log, log squared, squared has it. Yes, thank you. Actually, it's, that's very, very, yes. So, I mean, there's a, there's a sort of somewhat trivial sense in which the equivalence principle is violated at high energies, which is that when you look at effective terms, I mean, the, the equivalence principle is an accidental symmetry, and you know, when you look at all sorts of non-minimal couplings will appear in the action yeah. in yeah. higher order, you know, F mu nu contracted with the you know, tensor. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not at all surprised, I'm just, so, so I'm just that pointing kind of out. Stuff, presumably these effects this, could be described you know, so, in terms of which yeah, for some pe being For called. some people, the equivalence principle really is just an organizing principle. It, yeah. it, you, you write out your actions, and you... And you it's like baryon numbers. It's no, you can you can write terms in the effective action. Yeah, yeah. I, Very easily, that's my point. Yeah, right. they just yeah. happen to be yeah. irrelevant. So, yeah. so right. Yeah. And this this however is a, is a required effect. So it's you know it comes with a fixed coefficient. Um, but doesn't it come? Can you interpret this as those terms being induced by integrating out the loops? Uh, these terms aren't that. Though th th this one, this this guy here is actually connected to the coefficient of one of those terms. Mm -hmm. um, you can sort of see it's basically there's some term in the Lagrangian that's been renormalized that's different for photons and scalars. Right, right. And this is the log that comes along associated with that. Um, so yes, there there will be a, a local term there too. Back to the leading correction to the angle. So isn't that just from the leading correction that Schwarzschild gives? Uh, or you said it wasn't. It's not Schwarzschild. Let's, I mean, it's it's more than just Schwarzschild. I mean, it's the, the number isn't the next Schwarzschild piece. It's, uh, it's, no, but I think, I it's, think it is a, it it should should be correction to the deflection angle. It's, a, it's the classical deflection to the... In Schwarzschild. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the correction the the by the way, there is yeah, a paper right. by Sterman and collaborators yeah. and you know, which seem to get the wrong number. Oh, yeah? I've been discussing it. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> uh, we can discuss it. Um, and you know, that there is a little tricky point about what is the interpretation of B. B has to be thought as the angular momentum and not as the closest approach to the geodesic. Okay. Uh, the difference well, is, the is of that huh? In other words, the asymptotic. The asymptotic B and not the closest approach to the yeah. Otherwise, okay. you, you mix exactly that. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, it looks like that should come from the same yeah, correction the of the metric that we just saw over here. Okay. I, I'm going to not say all, I, what I wanted to say about all massless particles, because, but it's just to say some of the things that have been done. The people doing this, Dunbar and Norwich, And then Mohammed Anberg did a little takeoff of theirs, but basically followed them. Um, there's graviton graviton scattering, has its, its a lovely low energy theorem. There's scalar, massive scalar scatterings. And then there's, let's say, A plus B goes to A plus B, which is what Mohammed did. It just it takes away some of the diagrams of that. Um, but there are the, some of the lessons I did want to say is that there's IR divergences all over the place. Oh, um, as you can expect with scattering of massless particles, um, I, I didn't go through too much detail there, but you know, if you just write out the box and triangles diagrams, there is one over epsilon squared, one over epsilons uh, that um, we know how to deal with in scattering. But basically, in the box and triangles, everything is either an infrared divergence or or non-local by my definition of here. It's either logs or one over epsilon infrared or logs. 
One thing that's interesting to know in in massive scattering, there's no no square roots. And nothing like something that's square root omega over uh, s over t or something like that. That doesn't occur. Um, so you don't get these classical type style effects. Um, they just doesn't occur. And then in the, in the Feynman integrals that occur there. And then the last thing I said I would say is, is no running of G. This is also not a, a surprise, but if to any effective field theorists, but there's a lot of people in the literature who try to make G run. Um, but basically, if you, if you look at all these processes that come out here, there's no good definition of, of G that absorbs any subset of the corrections. And then the reason is, is clear. In normal renormalization groups, you're renormalizing your, your original coupling. And so every time you have the renormalization of that guy, which is universal, you get the log coming along with it. So there's a universal property. <coughs> Here, when you do loops, you don't renormalize the leading coefficient at all. You renormalize all these higher order ones. <coughs> and the higher order ones enter into different processes in different ways, and, and they just don't organize themselves that way. So anyone that says that there's a running of G in the perturbative regime, you know, maybe non-perturbatively, like it's something different, we, we could, um, I would say that you just look at all the reactions and you don't see it. <coughs> so the story that involves, you know, area over 4G plus yeah, yeah. entanglement entropy, exactly. and then there's some story that involves renormalization of G there. So yeah, well, well you, I think you, you know, in, in in any one process, yeah. you can define a renormalization of running of G, any single okay. process, uh -huh. but it's not going to be useful in some other process. Okay, so you're saying maybe in that particular in that particular process, the, it may be a great thing to do in one process. Well, you need matter. So you do like GQ squared, um, uh, but of course G, it even doesn't make sense because Q squared can e have either sign, so GQ squared isn't, isn't a great one. Anyhow, there's there's a lot. Uh, well, I don't. Let's not go there. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about this nonlinear completion. And the basic idea here is that the the um, scattering is is of course not the most interesting thing in in general relativity. Um, and we'd like to do other things also. And but this perturbative treatment seems tough to do that way. Um, and <coughs> there are some explorations of of some of these things in the gravitational literature. I'm not. It's certainly you find it in various places. Starobinsky is the first that I've seen. And when I got here, Jim Hartle gave me a paper where he did something quite similar. But the people that have have explored it made a program out of it is this Barvinsky, Vilkovsky. And basically they have what they call an expansion of the curvature. And the the they have a lot of non-local terms. So basically those types of things I will talk about here is R log box R. Okay? 
uh, not, this is a something very similar to the logs that we've been discussing, except now it's it's got the full curvature there instead of just an external field. Um, at the, they also have one over. Let's let's write this one out just so you can see what it looks like. To log box one over box two. R1, R2, <coughs> R3. Okay, so those are various curvatures, and they come up with also sort of indices here. Um, this one is sort of we we you know, have a sense of it's the log Q squared that comes along. These guys are certainly there in their in their framework, and it's not clear t t to me or I, I'm not sure anybody that this is a sensible expansion sensible expansion. Is this term any smaller than this? So it's got three curvatures, but it's got a one over box. And in some cases, um, that one over box, let's, let's imagine that this, this was F mu nu acting, that one over box gives you one over photon, or one over zero. Um, so it's not clear that this is a sensible expansion parameter. But anyhow, in flat space, this log box is really just means the following. It's if I take x goes to y log box, it's the integral d d um, d4 q 2 pi to the fourth e to the minus i q dot x minus y log minus q squared. Okay, but then interpreting it in general relativity is a, another story. But if you work to second order of the curvature, you would find that in fact, here you get an, an effective action. So here's the action um, written in sort of quasi-local form, d4 x squared minus g. You get this r log box r. Uh, in a nice basis, you can do vial. And then my favorite term is one that looks like r mu nu alpha beta r log box. Sorry, it takes a few minutes to, seconds to write out. r mu nu log box r mu nu r log box r. Okay. Um, these guys, these guys are things that I, uh, could have some scale in them, because the, the, the scale piece is a local piece, so let, let's call it lambda one, lambda two. Um, that's the local pieces, and there's the non-local pieces that come along with it. The coefficients of these guys are predicted. I'll tell you what some of them are. Um, this guy is totally non-local. Because the local piece of that is the Gaspinet term, and it, so these are terms in the one pi effective action in, induced by graviton loops. Is that yeah, graviton loops or particle loops. Any any loops do this. Okay, basically, the, as you know, as you sort of know, you you when you renormalize r squared, along with the the one over epsilon comes the log boxes, log log q squareds, and so in this nonlinear completion that they've done. It terms like the, the renormalization of R squared also picks up a log box. So, something I don't understand is yeah. what what gauge is this done in? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, if I do a calculation of an action in gravity, it's not gauge invariant in the sense of being independent of the gauge parameters. Yeah. Um, they they have a uh, a very peculiar gauge that they've chosen, which basically amounts to H, you know, the, the local field is one over box R mu nu, and you normally can have some gauge dependence correction to that. Okay, so the choice of a gauge is actually to throw that away. It's a, it's a, it's a great question. I, uh, the answer is not simple. They don't, they don't, 
they rarely seem to choose a gauge except for this piece here. That's, that's how I tend to call that part. And then they the, somehow complete things yeah. by invoking general covariance. Well, they, they, they're doing, so, yes, yes. Um, they, they do a non, non-linear or non, non-local heat kernel extension where these guys become parts of the coefficients in, the, in, the, in this non-local heat kernel expansion. Yeah, I, think, I think they do better than complete. They really do the calculation. They, they do a real calculation. I think so. Yeah, it's, it is a, it's definitely uh, a real calculation. Goals, oh, it's long term. I mean, they have ghost determinants. They have all that. But it, but it is true. It's hard to pick out where in there they've chosen the gauge. That's. And this is, this is one loop? It's one loop. And all these one terms loop. are, this term is one loop, and that term is one loop. They're both there. So one way of thinking about them is they're trying to categorize the effects that you find at one loop. Um, it may not be a great expansion, but um, anyhow, so the, these coefficients here, um, I don't know. Let, let me just give you one set. The alpha coefficients are zero for conformal fields. So if you chose conformal matter, then it's only non-zero for gravity. The beta is not going to play a role in what I do. The gammas do. Gamma is for scalars, it's minus one. For fermions, it's minus eleven. For photons, it's minus sixty-two. And for gravitons, it's plus two ninety-eight. Okay. So anyhow, these these are these are that's divided by. 1 over 1, 1, 5, 2, 0 pi squared. Okay. Okay. But you can read these things just off the renormalization, the, the, the local heat kernel, because they are the renormalization terms in the local heat kernel also. Um, Should this give you compute black hole entropy corrections from this action? Should it agree with the. Uh, what you would get just by looking directly at the one loop determinant for the fluctuations. It would seem like it should. On the other hand, the signs you're getting there aren't what consistent with what I remember. Well, maybe they're maybe you're looking at the vial piece. <coughs> um, the vial piece is three eighteen thirty six and one twenty six. Vial squared. Maybe those are the coefficients. They're all positive for the vial squared one. Um, anyhow, uh, what I wanted to say here just has some um, some application of this in um, in cosmology. So an application is Friedman cosmology. Um, here there's some slight dancing on our heads that you have to do. I mean, you, you have to switch over to the in-informalism so that you get causal behavior. Uh, that, just, that just gives you a particular thing. Actually, that's actually so, some, has somewhat interest. So the, the, the output of this log piece that you have there, if you go over to something that's only time dependent, and using the in-in formulation, you get a function, this following function, L of t minus t prime. It's non-local in time. So it's minus the integral infinity to infinity d omega over 2 pi e to the minus i omega t minus t prime log mu over omega plus i pi over 2 sine omega. That gives you the causal stuff. And this turns into, it's, it's a theta function, t minus t prime over t minus t prime, um, principal valued. And maybe I won't write out the, the, what that exactly means, but there's a limiting procedure to get the principal value of this. What's that first term? Something log? This is log, um, uh, sorry, that's an omega. Oh. Thank you, sorry. And it's actually absolute omega. 
All right. So this gives then um, equations of motion that depend not only on the present time, but on the, the time in the past, what, what the curvature was doing in the past. So you get non-local in time Freeman, Robertson, Walker equations um, that, that depend on this, this guy here. So, you know, you've got your a dot squared terms at that's 8 pi at some time. Then there's, depending on the types of fields you have, there's terms that depend on things like a double dot at t. I'm not writing this in great detail. Minus infinity up to t. This dt prime L of t minus t prime and some curvatures in the past. Okay. This depends on what these guys do. That changes some of the evolution. Well, um, this is, well, this is a leading leading quote unquote yeah. correction, but there are other corrections that are probably competitive. As soon as well, it's you know it's for, it's formally leading. I can make it I can make it even better leading because I've got I can dial up my number of fields here. I can make oh, this yeah. thing yeah. I can make this thing ten thousand fields, mm -hmm. um, and then it then it it then gravity becomes unimportant. Gravity is classical. And this is just the the leading part. And in fact, as as I commented here, if I'm using conformal matter, okay, the vial piece drops out because we're in Friedman Robertson Walker space. The the R piece drops out. The leading piece here is independent of any parameters if I'm using conformal fields. Um, so that's the. Yeah, let me just close with the the. Some results. They're just one thing I worried about when I started it is was does this screw up classical behavior? Sorry, can you, was this, this was an equation here. This thing equals zero. No, no it actually equals rho. Sorry. Uh, okay. okay. And the important eight. thing is you, you n is the number of massless degrees of freedom that you have. Yeah, the n, n is the number of massless, which as a theorist I'm allowed to, to dial up. Yeah. Okay. And it depends on their flavors also. Um, yeah. Uh, and if I don't make it all conformal, it depends on, on some more than that. It depends on one of these scale factors here. Right. Okay. Um, Okay, so yes, Dan. Is, is it consistent to have non-locality on the left-hand side, but not worry about non-local corrections on the right-hand side? Well, I, I have I can do that too. Um, you know, in a sense, that's what. Well, that I I, I have done some matter non-localities also. So photons, for example, I have a. Uh, uh, an idea on on how we could make non-local stuff over here. What I've done is this is just plugging it in to usual Friedman, Roberts, and Walker. Okay. Um, the first thing is a positive result in a sense. It doesn't screw up anything. If I had to take some initial conditions that where this is this is the let's say the scale factor, um, where this is classical, and I and I turn on the, this effect, give, you know, I have to give some initial conditions there. This is the quantum one, but the, the after an initial shift, you go over to classical behavior. The, these terms become small. That's good. I mean, I was at first, so it's not that sensitive to past times. Um, I was worried that t minus t prime isn't that much of a suppression. It was going to screw up stuff in the distant past. It doesn't. <laughs> the the other one is a, is this hint of singularity avoidance. Okay, if I I'm then running it not in the expanding phase but in a collapsing phase. Um, 
this is actually plotting a dot here. Classical behavior heads off down to the singularity um, in collapsing phase. And in many cases, not all, I'll say that, but in many cases, if you run this, um, this with the quantum effect as a perturbation, it, it follows this for a while, and then it goes boom, 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 and then it starts doing that. Okay. Now, as an effective field theorist, I have to ask myself, when, I, when can I trust this? Okay. Well, I should actually be able to trust it right here more than I trust it down there because, in fact, the curvatures are smaller, so that's that's okay. Um, but I, you know, as, as you start deviating 100% from the, the the behavior, I don't know how much I can trust it. Um, I think that requires some more work to see that. But just to prove that I'm a good effective field theorist, I didn't even run it, run the program past that stage, um, where where it's of course tempting to say, well, maybe this is the big bounce and it starts expanding, but I haven't even run the program. What is the difference with Starbinsky's solution? Well, Starbinsky is, is his local stuff. I mean, I think... Well, it's non-local stuff. His 79 solutions are non-local. Yeah, he, his, his 79 solution was actually, he has this new, it was a new local energy momentum tensor. That that follow that was local though. Um, it actually it's actually related to this. I mean I, I agree. I, I but he has. Let's let's talk about it afterwards. Yeah. No, so he's he does have some terms that are basically from anomalies that, that it's very much similar to this, except he doesn't have the and Starbinsky does and all the other papers have have the logs. That's what I said. Yeah. He's, he's, but but in, in his in his inflationary one, in the inflationary paper, he does he doesn't have the logs. So just art of the form. Yeah. Or sorry, art of it's, it's it's actually not just art of the the art. It's not just R squared either. Um, it's pre inflationary. Right? It's not just R squared. Yeah. So there's there's a there, 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 there's a there's a new there, there's a new source term that drives inflation that can't be uh, obtained from any local Lagrangian, that presumably can be obtained from some non-local Lagrangian, but it's as a source itself is, is local. It's just a new, um, and, and that's the thing that turns on inflation, and the R squared is the thing that turns off inflation in, the, in that original one. Yeah. Right. And it's, which is actually funny now, because everyone thinks of Starobinsky is R squared inflation. Actually, R squared is the, is the thing that stops inflation. Yeah. But, but that's a, that's another story. Anyway, so uh, you know, I'm, I I don't know how far to push this. How, you know, what to claim on this? In the, um, it's a, certainly a hint. It seems that the non-local effects, in many cases, have the, this effect. Now, it's also true that in some cases, depending on your matter content whether, and whether you what type of uh, energy density you have in the, in the universe that you can get effects that turn down. Um, so it's it's not a universal property. Does it depend on the sign of gamma? Is that um, it does. It does this depend on the sign of gamma. Um, yes. So is but, that the crucial thing? Well, it's 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 it's, it it's not just that. You know, yeah. Uh, uh, it, if you're running it with a radiation-dominated matter and gravity, it actually doesn't do anything. It just stays along the classical path. Um, if you do matter-dominated, it bounces. And the curvature scale where it bounces depends on this A, right? Yes, that's right. And you, 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 that's actually very easy to see. You just push, you know, you make N 100 times bigger and it shifts down by a factor of 10. It just squares like 1 over one over root n. All right. Well, maybe I'll just wrap up there. That's my main results. The rest of the stuff was just words um, about about effective field theories and gravity. That's that's the the the, the, the work related stuff that I did. Okay. okay.
give maybe a, a one paragraph synopsis of your words. On okay. Um, all right. So the, the, of, the, of the challenges that I see, one one is this infrared divergence issue. Um, that that it's clear that loops are going to be infrared divergent when you do even these these all of these types of effects too, and I don't think that's been I, clearly there have been infrared divergences found, but I think it's going to be a universal property of of loops in, in gravity. And it's not clear what cuts it off. Probably more interesting for the crowd here is the idea that actually there is something different about the effective field theory of gravity from other effective field theories. The effective field theory, most effective, other effective field theories, you take the extreme infrared limit, you, it becomes more and more trivial. In gravity, that's not the case. The, if you're working on a, on a in, in some, some background that has some curvature, as you, your effective field theory has some troubles as you um, go to the extreme infrared limit. So I can set up my little effective field theory here. I have to put in some, some boundaries and take in the initial data, whatever has happened in the past of so this region influences my little region. But as I try making that region bigger, you can see the sort of things that happen. One, even one of them, they're the most innocuous, but it's, it's clearly going to happen, is that as, you, as you're, you take a small curvature and you go a long distance, you're going to get large effects. Um, I mean, sorry, my example in this is Riemann normal coordinates. Alpha equals theta, y alpha and y beta. Um, y is the deviation from my wherever point I'm starting with. Just technically, you're going to get numbers that are of order unity here if you go far enough in a small background. And that's indicative of many of the, the interesting gravitational effects at low energies. Now, it's possible the effective field theory can solve that by doing a series of effective field theories where you, you build this one and then you build one next to it and you set up initial data there. Um, but it hasn't been done. It's different from other effective field theories. And then associated with that are more severe things. If I try taking infrared limits that go past the black hole, for example, you obviously have troubles with both the singularity and the horizon. Singularity problem is probably um, could be dealt with by cutting out a little hole and making that a source, but but I don't know really know how to do it. Um, and the horizon problem, of course, gives you the usual things that you don't know how to do propagators past, past horizons. So there are things in gravity that are distinct from other effective field theories that are challenges. Um, I think they're interesting to try to sort out, see if you could actually make them work. And for example, this, this one here is a, an easy one to start doing a series of effective field theories in different regions. Anyway, that's, that's the one paragraph summary. <laughs>